I remember going, coming here uh, with uh, three or four volunteers from uh, my soldiery, my batman, my groom. There was a, uh, a gunner who <coughs> was an artist. He'd been to the slave school, as indeed I had, and we'd both been students at the slave school of fine art. It doesn't look a very salubrious place in which to have worked, no, does it, it? It never did, but it looks more salubrious today than it has done in the past. <laughs> They're exactly as they were, you know, except that they a little bit cleaner, perhaps. And you worked in there? We used to lie, lie, full length there, either on our tummies or our backs, with a candle sticking out, and used to pass the earth back in sandbags, out here, a chain of chaps, and they would empty it somewhere outside. And we cleared these places out. We didn't dig them, species. That's not our digging. We were clearing out previous excavators trenches or tunnels in order to find out what was there and we planned as well as we could uh, generally at night and down through this mass of masonry and earth over the head from the bar which is just above here the bar of the pub it's unbelievable how much we heard we heard the local sequence the local scandals and the, the tapping on the floor and they got a bit merry towards the end until finally about half past nine at night we couldn't bear it any longer and we went up, we crushed ourselves, went up to the bar and we welcomed up there like heroes from the battlefield, you know, which is pretty well what the situation was. It was quite interesting, we were lying on our backs in the darkness here with those candles flickering over our heads. Uh, quite interesting to discover as far as one could by touch very largely what the Romans had had there, uh, what it was possible to uh, to resurrect, as it were, from the earth, uh, to recreate uh, a piece of human endeavor, because that gateway was planned and thought out and built by men who knew their job with a certain originality, their features of the gateway which are unique, and uh, which produced one of the monuments, uh, architectural monuments of Britain in its earliest phase of civilization. And uh, since then, it has remained, my, such as it is, with all its uh, certain inaccuracies, uh, the standard plan of this uh, famous gateway. Well, of course, it, it's been, been that for over half a century. Anything that is right for over half a century must be wrong. And I'm not the slightest doubt that when in due course, and I hope it's a long way off, this splendid pub, is uh, removed and the gateway is cleared for the mere archaeologist. I have no doubt that all sorts of mistakes uh, will be discovered in my original sketch done on my back in the darkness in the tunnels which we've been looking at. Did you, when you left here, did you really think that you would survive the war? Were you aware of the possibility that you would You don't think of it. It's the other man who's going to get this healed. It's always the other man. Sometimes it isn't, but then there's an accident. No, I, I, one doesn't think of a future like that. I, I don't, don't like to say this because, no, I don't really think I will say it, but if I did say it, what I would be saying is this, that I, I've enjoyed my wars as I've enjoyed my peace. I've enjoyed them. But l certainly the first war, less than the second. Uh, I, I don't say it in any sort of callousness. I, callousness. I've lost my friends and lost many other things in the course of these wars. But the, everything one does has some reward hidden away in it. And the thing is to discover that reward and to, uh, uh, to enjoy it. Passchendaele was the most criminal battle of modern times. It was a battle ordered by men living far behind the firing line. When I took over my battery in Passchendaele, my field battery, I took over tomorrow field battery there, I took it over not from a man, but from a pool of blood. And that sums up Passchendaele for you. There was in Passchendaele where a new outlook on the establishment. Uh, Passchendaele was one of the many worst battles in history. But, um, uh, uh, I've, I've found Passchendaele interesting, tragic, but 
the emotional side of these things, if you once begin to let the emotional side appeal to you too much, then you cease to think. And I prefer to regard things not as good and bad, uh, but as interesting or uninteresting. Byron, you know, said what I think about this. Old Byron knew a thing or two, didn't he? Um, it gave me a standard of misery, a physical misery, above which everything in my life has risen and is bound to rise. And let me tell you, if I can find it, what, um, by how Byron put it, because he put it beautifully. Oh dear, what is it? Where is it? Wait a minute. Yes. Byron put it this way, and he, he was right. Through many a climbed his mind to go, with many a retrospection cursed. And all my solace is to know, whate'er betides, I've known the worst. That exactly expresses what Passchendaele and others like the Somme and other battles like that gave, must have given to those who participated. It certainly gave to me. Mm. At the end of the war, I was then in command of a field battery or something else. I was put in charge of a district in Germany which included a number of museums and was near the big museums of Cologne and Bonn. I continued my work, or rather I began my work on my studentship there. I finished it. When I came out of the army, I had my thesis in my pocket and I presented it and it was on a subject which was unknown to my examiners, and so they passed me and gave it to me. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's a little secret story. So after the war, Dr. Mortimer Wheeler, MC, the soldier archaeologist, came back to Colchester to the museum in the Norman Castle. Uh, we recovered the plan of the Balkan Gate from the museum here and dressed it up for publication. And that was published in the same year, 1920, and uh, was, I proudly think, my first contribution to the literature of that. So it was this business of publication that really brought you back? Yes, that brought me back. When I got back here and uh, recontacted my various friends here, I found there were all sorts of new problems because a great area in the center of the town had been bought and handed over to the town and for the first time the public could get in to this uh, castle. And it, it was here that according to medieval legend, there was originally a palace of old King Cole. Let's go down and look at old King Cole. Well, presumably, old King Cole for you was a lot of nonsense. Oh, yes. Uh, actually, my guide and friend in 1920, when he brought me down here, I uh, didn't uh, talk about King Cole. He said, I'll take you down to the dungeons under the castle. And these down in the depths, a kind of archaeological sixth sense took over an intuition that was to lead him again and again to the buried truth. Uh, remember, Magnus, that what I saw here, my companion, when we came down, uh, for the first time, was two long, vaulted tunnels. Uh, these partitions, as you'll see in a moment when you get to them, are uh, uh, inclusions. Two long tunnels, and the plan was obvious. The plan is the substructure of a great temple. And I remember, at that very moment, I turned to him and I looked him in the eye, but in the half light, uh, half a candle or something, I thought I must look like an owl, and I said, Dungeons, dungeons be damned. This and is that, that was the beginning of this great discovery. How did you know it was Roman as easily as that? Well, it, it, there were several reasons. First of all, the building below had no relation whatever on plan uh, to, the, uh, to the keep which overlies it. They, they weren't the same idea, the same structure, the same world. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the keep upstairs, as you know, is full of bits of brickwork and so on, reuse in Roman buildings. This was built on a new clean site. There isn't any, any reuse stuff here at all. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, it was built in a peculiarly Roman way. Uh, a way which you can see on the, in Rome and uh, 50 places. Built by bringing up uh, shuttering, by building up shuttering and pouring this liquid concrete uh, in between. It was an and, enormous temple, wasn't it? Oh, it was enormous. But never mind, it's the, uh, it was exactly right for the substructure of a temple. 
whether it was the temple of Claudius, which is known to have been here at Colchester, and which was destroyed by Burdicea. You mean Boudicca? I mean Burdicea. You say Boudicca, do you? Yes. Why do you say Boudicca? Because it's correct. Because you're showing a proper, the proper respect of one who did not know her. I, I've known Boudicca for more than years, I like to remember. And as an intimate friend, I call her Boudicca, which is a much more affectionate, charming, intimate name. So Boudicca. <laughs> uh, she came here, uh, sort of the head of the woman's live of the period, uh, and more than that. And uh, with her tribesmen from East Anglia, she set fire to the town and destroyed the Temple of Claudius. It's all recorded in history. When you think about Boudicca, or Boudicca, do you think about the, as you're digging, do you think about the appalling carnage that took place here in AD 61? Are you consciously aware of people dying, people defending themselves desperately? Well, I would have been in a more civilized period 20 years ago, perhaps. But if you think of Biafra, if you think of Bangladesh, and of the thousands or millions of people that are killed in the course of a, an uprising in an area just about as large or small as the area which Boudicca covered in her rampages. It isn't really, really beyond uh, Im one's imagination, is it? I see you've started calling her Boudicca now. Are you on her side against I, the Romans? I, I'm being nice to you, my dear. <laughs> being nice. Are you on her side against the Romans? I'm never on anybody's side. I'm, uh, I, I'm on the touchline. I'm, I'm just a spectator, uh, taking down notes. The next 10 years for Wheeler were spent not spectating, but crusading, an all-out effort to build up the fledgling profession of archaeology in Britain. It was not until 1930 that Wheeler and his forces came here to St. Albans, Roman Verulamium, and to a wooded hillside across the valley, Prey Wood, for the first of his major excavations of Roman Britain. He was soon to become a public figure, but behind it lay years of hard graft and careful planning. Since we last met at Colchester, in imagination, we've passed over ten or a dozen years, the twenties of the century. And during those twenties, it was my task, as merely one of the few survivors in the field of archaeology after that first war, uh, to lay down a basic technology for the craft. Uh, in other words, to uh, uh, establish uh, a satisfactory method of recording stratification. You know, the layer, layer upon layer in the soil and reading the soil like reading a book. Well, that has to be, had to be uh, uh, systematized and in Wales and various forts in Wales and elsewhere in the west of England I've been working hard at this uh, technology. In Preywood, the new technology was put to work. His soldier's eye for the terrain led Wheeler to these uplands in his search for the stronghold where ancient British kings held court before the Romans came. In the wood behind where I'm sitting now, underneath the bushes and the bracken, lie the remains of the first city of Verulamium, which we found and excavated and planned or over 40 years ago. And then, of course, this uh, undergrowth wasn't quite what it is today. We cleared it away. We found the banks and the ditches. Every day we used to take down to our headquarters a sack full of pottery over our shoulders, which a uh, pottery belonging to this uh, uh, pre-Roman city, 2,000 years ago. Who were the people who lived here 2,000 years ago? The picture we get from Julius Caesar is just a bunch of road-painted savages. Yes, but have you ever seen troops in the front line? They always look like road-painted savages, you know? And he, he didn't know how they lived very much about them. Uh, he saw them in, in action, fighting for their lives, cutting the throats of his legionaries and so on. Well, that's not an ideal situation in which to sum up the character of a man or a civilization, is it? Uh, they, they lived in disgusting squalor domestically. But you can, you, can, you can find many examples of people who lived in domestic squalor uh, domestically and yet were great artists, great merchants and so on in, in a wider field. I, I could give you examples, but it would be invidious to do so. Not for the conquering Romans, the domestic squalor of the ancient Britons. A new Verulamium arose, a place of elegance and style and gracious living.
Romans built their city confidently on the pastures by the riverside. And we know how they built it, because Wheeler and his new technologists dug here too. All that stretch under those playing fields is very lame. We dug 11 acres of that, and we found uh, half a dozen or more large residential houses, uh, rather luxury houses. This was a smart part of the town. And uh, uh, they had mosaic floors and heating apparatus, central heating, all conveniences. It was a very, a very uh, well-developed city. <laughs> It was during this excavation that Wheeler first showed his flair for publicity, for sharing archaeological discoveries with the public who financed them. We are standing on the site of the ancient city of Bedulamium, the civic predecessor of St. Albans. Bedulamium was a city for a century or more before London was heard of. These men are digging into the floor of a Roman house to find out, to find the remains of earlier houses beneath it. As they dig, they find Roman pottery and various other Roman objects. Visitors to St Albans and to Verulamium during the next few weeks will be able to say, see something of the way in which their ancestors lived there nearly 2,000 years ago. Behind me you see the floor of one of the wealthier houses of Verulamium. It was probably laid down originally by Roman or Italian craftsmen. An extra dimension was being added to archaeology, mass appeal. Archaeology was news and newsreel was a novelty. Wheeler was the first archaeologist to exploit it deliberately for his profession, as 20 years later he was to exploit the pulling power of television. Here is another vessel which has come from the well bearing the inscription Bibi, B-I-B-E, which means, of course, drink. What the drink was, we're not informed. Well, Magnus, here's the only Roman theatre you can see in this country. And I think it's rather an interesting one. It's a sort of economy, a economy amphitheatre. As I say, it was built as an amphitheatre for uh, blood sports, but it had a little stage on one side. And as time went on, the stage became more and more important, and the blood sports became less and less important. It was a comforting thought. <laughs> and uh, they enlarged the stage, you see, until it uh, encroached on the central arena a great deal. And the rest of the arena was filled with the special seats for the mayor and corporation. We found the posts where they'd been placed. Did you dig this yourself? Yeah, well, I was responsible for it, but the, the, the hard work was done by uh, Kathy Kenyon. And, and uh, there was no looking back for Kathy Kenyon after that. Uh, she's now uh, principal of St. Hughes at Oxford. So it did her no harm, you see, to start in the, on the stage. As your pupil? Yes, my pupil. Uh, well, well I, I wouldn't like to say. Yeah. All right. And, uh, and you see how the, the theatre itself has been enlarged. You see successive walls got larger and larger as time went on. I suppose the population for a time was growing and people came in from the countryside to see a special show and that kind of thing. And then in the fourth century, towards the end of the Roman period, it seems to have gone out of fashion. Uh, it was filled up and used as a rubbish dump. And of course what was rubbish to them was very valuable to us. We found an awful lot of things there. Yes. Dumped in it. Was this smack in the middle of Verulamia? Uh, yes, it's just next door to the town hall. And uh, it was one of the central buildings. There was a temple in the field behind it, and there was a marketplace just opposite. It was certainly one of the features of the city. Built in the second century AD, petered out in the fourth century, but it had a, a lifetime of something over two centuries. Two centuries of theater. What they showed on the stage is nobody's business. Verulamium led him even deeper into the drama of the Roman conquest of Britain. Studying the terrain again, he pursued his quarry across a rolling landscape of Hertfordshire. Well now, uh, Mag, there's one fairly familiar character who was very much in my mind, I'll confess this, when I was working here on Verulamium in the region in the, in the 30s. And that is Julius Caesar. It seemed to me that early 
British history without Julius Caesar was the play without Hamlet. And uh, I, I, I was more and more determined to bring Hamlet onto the stage. Isn't this exactly what an archaeologist shouldn't do, which it, is to try to prove history? Yes, but I'm confessing this to you privately and personally. <laughs> and I don't want you to, to, to tell anybody else. Now, uh, where was, what did I do to, to discover either uh, Julius Caesar or somebody of the same name? Well, now, Caesar tells us that he was either campaigning or at least receiving the submission of tribes to the east of the site of Verulamium, over on the borders of Hertfordshire and Essex. He makes that perfectly clear, and he gives the name of the tribe, the Trinobantes. And he says that they had uh, sent hostages to him and so on. And then, and then he goes on to say that he moved against the, uh, his chief opponent, a man called Cassivellaunus, who belonged to the neighboring tribe, and uh, whose country we're in now. How did you track him down? Well, uh, if he moved westwards from Essex into Hartford, too, which is, if he'd had modern maps in front of him, he'd have said, he'd only really move where there are fords, and he would only find the enemy where there are fortifications. The two things went together, fords and fortifications. Well, across the valley of the Ver, near here, there are some very remarkable earthworks, ditches, they're known as Beach Bottom, on the way between here and Wheatamstead. I followed those ditches along, found out something about them, and they led me to the River Lee, five miles from here, to the ford across the River Lee, and bless my soul, overlooking that ford was exactly what I hadn't dared to hope for, a great oppidum, a great earthwork on a huge scale, on a scale bigger than anything else of its kind, in, uh, in uh, southern England, uh, with great fortifications. Here, surely, if anywhere, was what I was looking for. I noticed you said probably when you put this plaque yes, up. Yes, my dear Magnus, that was 40 years ago. One gets less cautious as one gets older. Don't you find that in 100 years' time, you know? But are you more convinced now than, than before yes. that this was the place? Uh, looking at it again, I'm inclined to say with Swift, what a genius I had in those days. And uh, <laughs> I won't press the point. Modesty is yeah, but, but my, my Modesty almost forbids. <laughs> hey, off you go. You know, with hindsight, it's, it's obvious now, since you pointed it out, that this was a great fortification. What put you onto it in the first place when no one else had noticed it before? Well, we followed it from spot to spot, you know, uh, along the valleys here, the great dikes we were looking at, the beach bottom and so on. They all pointed in this direction, and when we came here, here it was. And in my knowledge of this country, there is no comparable fortification. It's of enormous size. It's 120 feet across the top. And this isn't the bottom of it here. I've dug down to the bottom of it, which is five, six feet below your feet. And if you add that to the height you see, it is really a staggering place. It must have been the devil of a job to capture this place. Sir. It's a devil of a job to climb it now. What about having a shot? Come on, then. <laughs> come on. Am I going to? Come or? on, then. I, I'm going to, all right. <laughs> well, come on. What, what's holding you up? <laughs> <laughs> God is damned. <laughs> and fully armed, how much did a Roman hoplite carry or whatever the <laughs> No, I'm going to give it up. Uh, I'm, I'm the defeated British. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so you. You're the defeated Roman. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see how hard it is. Uh, although it isn't as smooth as it was in those times, it's, it's hard enough to climb to the top. And I, yet Caesar, I've done it several times. Caesar makes it sound youth. quite easy. You know, I assaulted from both sides and the enemy fled precipitously. Well, no, he, he, he obviously had a hard battle here. Uh, he, uh, the whole of Cassivellaunus, the, the British chieftain's forces, took refuge in this great enclosure. And they put up a fight against the legionaries who tried to get at them across this almost impossible defence. And uh, he ultimately 
the dis discipline of the legionaries won the day, and the British burst out in the opposite direction, in two directions, he says, and Julius Caesar won his last battle over the British, and then he had to go home. He had nothing. Did you also, as a military man, try to put yourself into Caesar's mind and work <laughs> out what he would have done? <laughs> Poor old Caesar. Uh, uh, put myself into Caesar's mind? Yeah, of course one does, well, when, in one's puny way. When, when, when you're dealing with Napoleon or, or any other big historical figure uh, of an active, mobile kind, you try to put yourself in his breeches or spurs or boots or whatever he was wearing, you see? It's inevitable. It's, it's recreating. You, the, one's whole life is devoted to recreating the past and making it live. Throughout those early years, another archaeologist shared and supported all Wheeler's enthusiasms and dreams, like his dream of founding in Britain the first Institute of Archaeology for teaching the new generation, his wife, Tessa. She and I were, were, were one. Uh, she was very important. Uh, she had infinitely more tact and patience than I ever had. And she supplied those qualities where I occasionally so to say, supplied the drive. The, the ideas and the drive had to come from me, but the ca carrying into effect of those ideas with all the immense tact and pertinacity that was necessary were due very largely to Tessa. And together, we, I think we made a very workable couple. And uh, uh, was, the ultimate result was that she died, alas, in 1936. It was just after that that our new institute was opened formally in the University of London, and it's gone on growing ever since. He was without his partner now, but he still had the forces they had trained. And now he turned to the West Country, to the hill fort of Maiden Castle. His base was Dorchester, the caster bridge of Thomas Hardy's Wessex. Wheeler had a passion for Hardy, and here he would uncover as dramatic a story as any Hardy ever told. I read a good deal of Hardy in my teens, for example, and of course he breathes Dorset at you. I didn't know anything about Dorchester or Dorset then, but uh, when I did go there years later, I felt that I knew it intimately already through Hardy, who lived, as you know, uh, half a mile or so from Maiden Castle. He constantly walked across the fields and climbed the steep sides of it, particularly the western entrance, which was the natural point of approach. And uh, once at least, he wrote about it in terms of appreciation. He says, at once every step forward, it rises higher against the south sky, with an obtrusive personality that compels the senses to regard it and consider. The eyes may bend in another direction, but never without the consciousness of its heavy, high-shouldered presence and its point of vantage. The profile of the whole stupendous ruin is varied with protuberances, which from hereabouts have the animal aspect of warts, wens, knuckles and hips. It may indeed be likened to an enormous many-limbed organism of an antediluvian time, lying lifeless, and covered with a thin green cloth which hides its substance while revealing its contour. Well, those are the words of Hardy. I, I think they're very, very, very effective words too. As, you, as the western entrance rises tier beyond tier, higher and higher against the sky, as you find your way up through it. Two thousand years ago, a Roman general came here to mount an assault on Maiden Castle. It was Wheeler's turn now.
It's a great pleasure, really. A slightly melancholy pleasure to come back and look at it again. Melancholy? Yes, yeah, slightly melancholy, as there is in most great pleasures. You know, Magnus, I've come to regard this place less as a, an archaeological curiosity or even than an antediluvian monster, as uh, uh, Thomas Hardy regarded it, than as a magnificent masterpiece of sculpture carved on the surface of the landscape by a man who might have been Michelangelo. And we can almost see it growing and almost hear it breathing. It's alive, as so every great work of sculpture is alive. And like any other living thing, Maiden Castle grew down the centuries from Stone Age to Iron Age, until by the time of the Roman invasion it covered about 45 acres. 45 acres of houses and workshops, 45 acres of familiar streets, and the homes of some 5,000 men, women and children, the tribal capital of the Juro Trigies of Dorset. They had their own coinage, their own art style, their own secure life on their hilltop refuge. Unlike most hill fort dwellers, they had two entrances to their stronghold, a fortified front door to the west, and another less heavily defended entrance to the east. Wheeler concentrated his forces at the eastern end, and in his excavation, he once again revolutionized the technique of archaeology. It's famous, if you like, or notorious, uh, for being the site of the invention of a technological gimmick. It's an it's a amazing accident. I, I take no credit for it, except I was, I was the chance medium for this experiment, and the experiment happened to work. It certainly worked. The Wheeler system, as it's called, now in use all over the world from America to Indochina. A grid of geometric squares instead of conventional trenches affords much greater control of the progress of the excavation and the excavators. The walls of the squares provide convenient paths for access and the removal of debris, and the stratified levels in the walls can be read at any time, like the pages of a book. Deceptively simple, like all great inventions. What Wheeler uncovered with this classic system on this plot of Dorset ground enabled him to relive a few violent hours of early British history. Yes, it's the most dramatic thing that I've ever been concerned with in this, in archaeology. It was the most astonishing thing, this. Let me tell you. Way back in the mists, somewhere behind us, is the Isle of Wight. And the, the Roman historian tells us that when the Romans landed in this country in force in the year 43 AD, they detached a corps or division under a man called Vespasian, who later on became uh, emperor of Rome, uh, to clear up the, the southern, what we now, now the southern counties. And we, we're told too that he captured the Isle of Wight and two important tribes down in this part of the world. And he also, uh, captured more than 20 opida, they call them. That's to say, native fortified towns, of which undoubtedly Maiden Castle must have been one. Well, now, that's where the story really begins. And it was very much in my mind when I was working here in the middle 30s. How did the attack take place? Where? What circumstances? Well, now, how would it take place if, if, you, were, if you were Vespasian? confronted by Maiden Castle, those great ramparts in front of him. He'd look round, you'd come to the weakest, weakest gateway, the weakest opening through those ramparts, and that'd be here. This is the eastern entrance. It's uh, a very formidable entrance, but nothing like so terrifying as the western entrance at the other end. Well, he came out here, and he had a look at it. He said, that's best for me. And the, the ramparts, were by now lined with the British defenders, all with, armed with sling stones. We found a, th their armament, over 22,000 sling stones altogether in a, in a pit by the entrance here, waiting to be used. And there they were ready, ready to use them. Well, Vespasian went about his job in the usual Roman fashion, methodically, in a very modern way. Every Roman legion, he had the second Roman legion with him, had a uh, regiment of artillery when it was uh, on campaign. And he uh, turned the regiment of artillery on to do its stuff. 
he he uh, deployed it somewhere down there, pointing in this direction. Uh, the ballisti, the guns of the period, the ballisti, let's say the, the great mechanical catapults, capable of discharging iron shod bolts, uh, a couple of furlongs. He put them in a line down there somewhere, we don't know exactly where, of course, pointing in this direction and let go. He covered the whole of this entrance with a barrage. Making these chaps who were standing up there with their slings duck, put their heads down, which is what he wanted. And he, he killed some of them in the, in the, in the process. We found a chap with a, a ballista bolt in his spine. He went in through the front, so he was facing the enemy when he was killed. Another one with a ballista hole in his skull and a lot of others. So that the battle had begun in terms of a barrage, as it does nowadays. And then, when they'd shot their bolts, as it were, he turned his legionaries onto the job and they came up around these two curvy uh, tracks which approached the entrance through the outer banks. Now, I've always married him. I've got a, a, clear, a, a clear vision almost of what happened and how it happened. His legionaries didn't stroll in with their hands in their pockets. I see them coming at a, at a steady trot up these approaches just as the Italian infantry today, you know, the, the, the Italian mountaineer infantry. Uh, they don't march, they trot. They go five or six miles an hour, not near four miles an hour. And here they came, trotting up with their short swords in their hands, with their shields over their heads. And they came in here. Still under fire where there's a Under up. fire. Well, now they were chucking the, the, the stones at them again because the barrage had to stop when the infantry came in, of course. And are uh, they defenders? where now those who were left uh, shooting at the enemy, at their enemy. Well, they came in, and they came in in a rush. It's the only way they could do it. And they got in amongst these chaps, and behind them were the, some of the citizens of the town, women and children, uh, cowering, waiting to wonder what has happened. And they um, cut down they cut down the defenders, oh, in mass, mass formation almost. They, one, one, one of these uh, Britons was cut down with no, no less than seven cuts on his skull. They killed him seven times. And others were killed th two, three, four times each. It was a massacre. Was, the place was littered with corpses in no time. We found 40 of them, all wounded, all with, all with fatal wounds, one kind or another. And I'm not, not, not rejoicing about all this. It was a very serious and sad event, but it was very vivid, dramatic. Well, that didn't take long. It may have taken 10 minutes before the legionaries were inside and the gates were being pulled down. Uh, the uh, uh, battles confused, but they, they went at it. They, they killed everybody they could reach, men, women, and even children. They uh, would go in, take the chiefs, the leading citizens, prisoners, uh, as they always did on these occasions. And then they would call to heel, and the, uh, the prisoners would be chained up and marched out. And the town itself would be left more or less derelict in a state of utter panic and despair, uh, with a, probably a, 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 a company of soldiers just to make sure they didn't behave, misbehave themselves. The uh, legionaries themselves would go down into the valley, probably down there by the river, and pitch their uh, camp for the night, uh, cook their meal. And in due course, for an hour or two, apart from the sentries marching up and down there, uh, the situation would be quiet. And during that quiet lull, the survivors would creep timidly out of their broken fortress and take their dead and bury them in roughly cut graves. And that's how we found them, in that semicircular space in front of the gateway, a level space there where there had been huts which were set, set on fire by the attackers. And there were heaps of warm rubbish and into that warm rubbish they cut these rough graves and they pitched into the graves their dead friends and relations 
one, two, three in the same grave, some of them sitting up, some lying down. But in every case practically accompanied by a small offering. Yes, that shows it, that the burials were carried out by their friends. A, a, a small offering to the gods of the other world or uh, a, a joint of meat, a joint of lamb was in the hands of two of them as their haversack rations for their journey uh, to the other, to, uh, across the, the river. You once wrote most memorably that archaeologists must always remember that we are not digging up things, we are digging up people. Yes. But what do you feel about the people that you dig up, people whose rest, you might say, you are disturbing, people who... I don't believe in disturbing in rest soil. at all. I don't believe that. That's a mere sentimental uh, tradition. No. If you, if, you, if, you, if you dig up a man with bulls and things all around him, like those people we dug up at the east end of Maiden Castle, now, they were dead, they'd been dead a long time, and they were going to be dead a long time. They're still dead. But around them were all sorts of possessions which were of interest to us. They helped us to put our, a little piece of our history into perspective, which we otherwise wouldn't have had, and so on. Uh, they enable us to reconstruct the world and the history within which we live. And I think that's worthwhile. We, did, we do no harm to these poor chaps. When I'm dead, you can dig me up three, ten times for all I care. I won't haunt you much. In the 20 years between the wars, he established archaeology as a serious profession. In his epic excavations of Roman Britain, most memorably at Maiden Castle in Dorset, he gave archaeology a new technology, a new status and a new public. Just before the Second World War, he stormed the Channel coast of France with a force of a hundred British archaeologists he had trained, mobile archaeologists.